Pratyush and I'm one of the co-presidents for ISA and we're so glad to be able to have another speaker series conversation with Dr. Krishnan tonight. Um, to start off, we just wanted to give you a brief introduction about ISA. The Indian Student Association is basically a cultural organization on UC Berkeley campus and we try to promote Indian culture on campus by organizing cultural events like Holi, Garba, Diwali. Um, but because of our virtual nature, we've, we've started a new speaker series where try to, we try to bring people and uh, prominent speakers from cultural, uh, political, and social spheres of India to have some important conversation on campus. Um, and tonight, we're, we're, we're happy to host Dr. Sunita Krishnan with us. But before uh, we introduce our guest today, we would like to have our moderators introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. My name is DARPA, and I'm part of the outreach team for ISA. Um, I'll be co-facilitating this event alongside Kavya today. Uh, we are so excited to speak with Dr. Christian today and learn more about her extraordinary work, um, both as an activist and an advocate. Uh, as a reminder, we did want to issue a content warning today uh, surrounding the sexual assault and trafficking. I'll now pass it on to Kavya, who will talk more about the structure of tonight's event. Hey everyone, thank you again for joining us virtually. Um, I'm the co-president along with Prithush and as Darpa said, I'll be facilitating with her. Um, while we are conducting this interview with Dr. Krishnan, please feel free to type your questions using the Q&A button on your Zoom screen. All of the council members of ISA are here to help facilitate the chat and other Zoom functions. So feel free to type um, your questions as they may come up. Um, we will address these questions in the um, second part of our event. Great, thank you, Kavya. So now we'll just introduce our speaker for tonight. Uh, Dr. Sunita Krishnan is the founder of Prajwal, which is Asia's largest institution combating commercial sexual exploitation. Since its inception in 1996, she has assisted in the rescue of more than 24,500 young girls and women across 12 different countries. Uh, she's also the recipient of the fourth highest Indian civilian honor, uh, which is the Padma Shri, and is recognized as one of the 150 fearless women in the world by Newsweek. Uh, she has also started to pave a path towards a world free of sex trafficking and sex crime, and has galvanized her vision by confronting traffickers, supporting survivors, and developing innovative models of prevention to disrupt the cycle of intergenerational exploitation. Uh, she spearheaded the first ever survivor-led campaign known as Raksha against sex trafficking, which reached over 1 million people. Uh, in 2015, Dr. Christian launched the hashtag Shame the Rapist campaign, which pushed reforms at the national level um, and resulted in forming a committee to block rape videos online and setting up the first ever cyber, cyber crime portal to report violent, sexually abusive online content. The public interest litigation against Facebook, Google, and other intermediaries brought about the first major regulatory reform throughout India to curb the proliferation of sexual violence throughout social media. Dr. Krishnan has played an instrumental role in drafting several victim-centered policies, including the first ever anti-trafficking policy in India, the policy for minimum standards of care, and she introduced video conferencing in order to record evidence of a traffic victim. She is responsible for bringing out comprehensive training manuals and handbooks for duty bearers regarding human trafficking. Her success and contribution have been recognized by the government of the United States, France, and Germany. She is also the recipient of the Steve Shakti Award, Talberg Global Leadership Prize, Franco-German Prize for Human Rights, Vital Voices Leadership Prize, Living Legends Award, the John J. International Award, DVF Award, Aurora Peace Prize, and CNN IBN Real Hero Award, among several others. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Krishnan to speak with ISA today. So everyone give her a warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you would like to say a few words before we get into the um, questions, feel free. I'm actually uh, feeling a little sleepy listening to such a long introduction of mine. <laughs> So let's get to business. Please start your questions and namaste and pranams to everybody sitting here watching this either live or recorded. Yeah, wonderful to be with all of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishnan. So as you said, we'll go ahead and get started with our first question for tonight. So can you start off by telling us what really sparked your interest in activism? Um, 
I think um, I would say I was a born activist in terms of I, I always uh, had this very strong sense of what is right and what's wrong. And that that's a very, you know, kind of a DNA thing because um, and a very surprisingly DNA thing because I don't I, I'm, I, I belong to a family that doesn't have any connections to social work or activism or advocacy. We, we, we are basically from a lower middle class uh, background where just, you know, just surviving and getting a job and doing well is the kind of the ultimate goal in life. So uh, it, it came as a surprise at least to my family and, and my, my community that, uh, you know, here was this person who was behaving differently because um, right from the age of three and then um, uh, by the age of 12, I was like a hardcore social worker with, in running my own school and things like that. So, um, uh, and then, you know, it, it became kind of natural for me to kind of uh, uh, become very mindful of the inequities around me. And uh, one of the first things that I kind of felt very strongly about was uh, caste discrimination and, uh, and the fact that uh, there are a whole world of people who are excluded uh, to access to opportunities just because they believe uh, belong to a particular community. And uh, so at the age of 15, I kind of got very, um, very involved in that kind of approach. But again, interestingly, my approach was not like going around doing some protests and protest march. So that is not the kind of activism I believe in. Um, and, and that's been the, you know, the way I've led my life throughout for the last 30 years. Uh, my way of activism is proactive solutioning. You know? So experimenting on proactive solutions is my way of challenging uh, a stereotype or a norm or, um, you know, you know, or to bring in a paradigm shift. So I kind of felt education is a very powerful tool. And, uh, um, and, and during that course, I, I kind of, uh, I think it was very successful, extremely successful. Uh, and, and one of the indicators of my success was that many people were upset. Many people were upset by my presence. Many people were upset by what I was trying to do. And then uh, I was subjected to, uh, to to be taught a lesson that I will not forget. And they did teach me a fantastic lesson, which became the triggering point for my future mission and my future activism. I was sexually assaulted by eight men and uh, I kind of changed my life, uh, uh, transformed my life, I would say, because for the first time then I, I was, I understood and I became very mindful of what a victim of sexual assault is subjected to, uh, how the world sees her, how the community sees her, how her, how her own family sees her and treats her. So, um, you know, getting a first-hand experience on that maybe uh, uh, was the triggering point for my activism to, you know, to end sex crime and sex trafficking in the world because I, I felt, uh, you know, while sex crime is what I was subjected to, um, I felt sex trafficking of uh, human beings that selling of human beings for the purpose of just sexual exploitation and somebody, you know, gaining out of it in terms of revenue and making money out of that was the worst form of sex, uh, not just sex crime, but also human rights violation that one could think about. So that became the triggering point for a lot that happened in my life after that. And um, suffice to say that, um, you know, uh, for, the la uh, for the last 30 years, uh, that's been my mission and that's been my activism to change things around, uh, you know, sex crimes against women and children. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, and kind of going off of that, when you were inspired to work on um, fixing like the pro problems with sex trafficking, um, how did your organization Prajwala start and um, how much support did you have when founding that? 
So uh, when I uh, got into activism and I started doing things, it, you know, I went through a lot of process in terms of trying to understand what the problem is. Because, see, as I, as I started off, I am not into mindless, uh, you know, protests. I, I, for me, for me, I'm a very results-based person. I, you know, whatever I do, I need to see some answers. And to get those answers, I had to understand the problem clearly. And so I spent a lot of years understanding the problem and understanding the the nuances of the problem and kind of trying to experiment and see what would change this problem. In the course of that, I kind of got into protests and I got into the women's movement and all the rest of it. And then went to the jail for a few months. And then uh, that was kind of, uh, you know, another very transformative uh, uh, phase in my life because first time I understood what it meant to be physically excluded from the world, isolated from the world, and then actually physically being rejected from my own family. So uh, I, that kind of, uh, you know, pushed the, or paved the way for me to, take some very hard decisions to uh, move out of uh, the place where my parents live, that's Bangalore, and, um, you know, making a change, relocating myself to Hyderabad. So when I landed in Hyderabad, that is when a very huge uh, red light area, which was located in Hyderabad, got erected, and, um, and uh, it was kind of natural for me, and I, I understood why I landed in Hyderabad. Otherwise, I actually, uh, you know, uh, a person who's very strategic in my thinking, that relocation was not a strategic move in terms of I didn't really, I didn't think why I'm going to Hyderabad or why I chose Hyderabad. The Hyderabad was just the ticket uh, that I got in the railway station. And so I just took it and came here. But once I landed and then I had this, you know, and this thing, whole, whole thing was happening in Hyderabad and I knew then why I came here and what is the reason for you know the universe conspiring to come make me reach Hyderabad and uh, and uh, and it was kind of natural for me to go and meet the women who were evicted thrown out of that place and um, to interact with them and find out what they wanted and everybody everybody unanimously said only one thing they said you know just forget about us take care of our children. And that's what that's how the idea of Red Villa began. And uh, and you must realize that you know I was thrown out of my own family. I was in a new land, a foreign land, a new new place, new domicile. Everything was new. People were new. The street was new. So there was nil support of any kind. Nobody knew me, and all that I had was um, uh, just a earring in my in my years, uh, when I say that, because it, it, it was a gold earring, so it, it meant that that was money. Uh, and the women who believed that I could do something for their children and their faith in me um, that, uh, you know, we could do something together because that's one of the questions I kept asking them that what is your input and what is your stake in improving the lives of your children? And uh, so they kind of had kind of, you know, collected whatever they had in, you know, in their anklets and their, all what they owned, you know, and they kept it. So that was one small, uh, you know, uh, resource that was available. So I started with that. So I became the first field worker of the organization. I became the first teacher of my organization. I became the first doer in my own set up and uh, uh, started with zero, zero support in terms of any funding project, blah, 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 anything. So I became, you know, whatever we had became our resource to start off with. So again, it would be very wrong to say that I had no support. I, I did have a, I had the support of my own self. I was fully into it and my entire being was in, into it. And then I had the support of the women uh, who, you know, who, were, who were, you know, absolutely thrown out. Maybe they were in a disadvantaged position, but we, we had the support of our uh, combined strengths of our faith in what we were trying to do. 
and uh, so the beginning was all about nothing in terms of external support and uh, beginning also was uh, because you didn't have any contacts you didn't have any any uh, you didn't have any ecosystem to kind of kind of enable your work so uh, you were you you entering a completely uh, you know a hostile terrain you know so um at one end uh, the world of traffickers and the people who were running the business were like looking at you very very suspiciously now what is she up to what is she trying to do um you know people around were looking at you very suspiciously because you'd never belonged to that place nobody you you were not a familiar face and uh, you yourself were struggling with survival because i was living in a slum was living under there's a bridge that is there in hyderabad called as a chadar ghat bridge so i was living right underneath that in a small shed so there was this you know a whole 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 world of apparent i would say hostility what was going through um and uh, the hostility became a little more aggravated and accelerated as the days passed because once I, i i we began we began as a small initiative for the children of women in prostitution and kind of started a small learning center and then you know because my larger goal was to end sex crime and sex trafficking uh, you know it became very natural for me to start having con- this conversation with these women now these women were evicted from the red light area but they they landed on the street there was no rehabilitation for them so they were all on the street and they were prostituting on the street so i would then ask them questions and how do you feel when your own children are studying and they're all you know kind of getting some access to opportunity and then you see a child as young as your child coming on the street with you to prostitute maybe from somewhere else and that is when you know you started kind of hitting their conscience in a different way and then there were some women who started coming and telling me that you know today we saw a 12 year old could you do can you do something about it so whether they said it with altruism or um, they had some uh, well being of the person in mind or they said it because it was a competition for them i don't know but whatever it is such information started coming and so when such information started coming and the kind of person that i was and the kind of you know absolutely you know um badass kind of a uh, rebellion that i was i i said okay we have to we have to respond and we have to do something about it and uh, again i you know i came from a background where i did not have trust in several things i did not have the trust in police i didn't have the i didn't have trust in the state and the system because i had gone to the jail and come out so i had seen the bad side of enforcement so i thought every ba- every police guy is really bad so you know so uh, in that context i decided that i will do it myself so uh, i got into rescue like some kind of a james bond activity and i would just you know uh, take a small team of people who who believed in the way i do from from the among these women and uh these people who started trusting me and then we would get thoroughly beaten up and then you know we would actually rescue one child and come out um and that's when the people you know the the trafficking syndicate started looking at me as a, as a potential threat okay so this woman is not just to run a school here she's doing something more than a school and she's kind of needling in affairs that she doesn't need to be and so the 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 founding years was you know the beginning part of thing was uh, uh, no money uh, in b- any big way a um, lot of beating up a lot of physical assaults uh, all kinds of drama you know like people would actually lock us inside the room that we were in and you know um, or uh, people would just take an auto on my feet or i would just be thrashed so badly that my ear ears got damaged my nose got broken and things like that so it was like a huge amount of fun and adventure the the beginning years i don't see so much of fun now but then um 
those years were really the golden period of my, you know, uh, one kind of activism. Oh, thank you so much for sharing your story, you know, from moving to Hyderabad, starting with nothing, but really thriving off the support of all of the women around you and helping them and their children um, as much as you can. So can you now talk a little bit more about maybe how you managed to spread awareness to a larger audience um, that maybe wasn't educated about the topics of violence against women? Um, in the course of my work, I kind of realized that uh, a big part of what I was doing was some kind of scavenging because I was just cleaning the problem. I was taking care of the victims or I was taking care of their children and then, you know, doing something. And slowly the realization set in that if the larger society and the larger collective conscience is not raised, things will not change. Meaning I will just feel very good about what I'm doing, but the larger world is not going to change. Things are just going to so there would be one Sunita Krishnan or some, you know, Kailash Siddharthi or some ABCD, and we will go on cleaning up the act and that's a whole other world who will be, you know, continuing to build that problem and continue to sustain the problem. And that's where I felt, you know, it's very important that um, we invest in, you know, awakening the community. And I was, I, I, I don't like to use the word awareness, I prefer the word awakening because uh, I believe that it can't be just about you getting an information and becoming aware of some problem, but you need to be awakened enough to feel that I have to act about it. I have to do something about it and I have to also do my bit to change this problem. That is uh, what I call as awakening and I, I felt very early in my, in my work with, with Prashvada that we need to start you know, strategically investing in that whole process. And so the, uh, the first work that we did was to start working in the local community itself, uh, the, the urban slums and villages where we started, not just awakening the community, saying that, okay, this is the problem, this is the danger, danger lurking around you, this is how the girls are, you know, are lured or deceived or some fraudulent means are used to put them in this place of exploitation. You are vulnerable. You are, you know, at potential risk to being, you know, taken in for this form of exploitation. But it is not just enough that you become, you know, aware of the problem, but you also have to take, you know, some decision to act on that awareness to start you know doing something about it and so what we started was something called as a community vigilant groups so we would speak to a group of community of say 200 300 people and say okay now you know the dangers of trafficking and you know the dangers of how your own children your own girls your own women could be you know at potential risk to be exploited in these space so what are you going to do about it can we build a vigilant group in our own communities to start changing this. And that's how the first community vigilant groups started coming. And then, uh, then it became a demand from the community vigilant group that's saying that, okay, we are very interested, we are volunteering and we want to save our community from this, but tell us how. So it was just like one speech would not do, you know, one session would not do. We had to organize a whole whole lot of capacity building programs. And that's how the training of the community vigilant groups started that, you know, not only we will awaken them, then we also tell them how to go about it. How do you, you know, spot a trafficker? How do you spot a potential victim? What are the things that you need to do to create vigilance inside your community? How do you monitor the movement of people in your, in your community? How do you monitor who is there, who's missing, where are they going? And how do you monitor, you know, whether somebody who's getting married is actually getting married to the right person or not, or somebody who's being offered a job is uh, being offered the right kind of job and it's a safe job and you'll not be exploited there. Or a missing girl who has eloped with a boy, you know, uh, 
checking on it whether the child girl is actually safely with that boy or he has he sold him to sold her to a, a brothel or something like that so we started giving them those training you know capacity building their their you know skills in in um, not just detecting the problem but also how to report the problem and what do you do after that so that meant that you know you had to really move out of your safe zones so it's not like oh i have got to know about sex crime very good, very bad very sad you know um it's it's so horrible and just move about it no it was about okay this is very bad and this is happening in my own community and then i'm going to change it and this is what i'm going to do 1 2 3 4 5 so that mean that meant a longer engagement now things like that when it over a period of time became a movement by itself within uh within uh, within the communities that we were dealing and um you know everywhere we would go and do these programs in the next 48 hours or 72 hours there would be people actually leaving those places you know kind of actually shifting their rooms and you know there would be so much of turbulence inside the community after we have done a session like this and that's when the survivors of um, these um this form of exploitation also started gaining the confidence that this can change and that's when they came all in here and they said that we would want to become part of these uh, these awakening programs we would like to be the kind of the witness and the you know we would testify before the community that this is what is i think that was a game changer for us because you know we were not telling the stories the actual survivors were telling the stories these were the you know these were the people who had gone through the whole problem and they would go to the community and say listen this is what happened to me and and if this can happen to me it can happen to your daughter too and your sister too so you know and, and this is these are the areas that i made a mistake and you know you need to be be mindful that there are people lurking out there of you know offering you love offering you marriage offering you jobs offering you film roles you know and they are all just waiting the predators trying to grab you so the survivors involvement in the awakening programs i think became such a huge uh, you know game changer in the awakening program that uh, uh we gain the confidence to uh, take it to a larger scale and that's how swaraksha was born and swaraksha became such an impactful campaign that uh, you know today it's part of a government program the government of telangana has adopted it as their state program so yes um, and uh, you know uh, awakening communities including uh, students sitting in berkeley to get awakened about this problem because this is not just an indian problem it's a problem it's an international problem it's a global problem and uh, one of the ways that we would do it is to engage in conversations like these so that uh, people who are listening to this is, are not just awakened but also uh, you know contemplating on how do we act how do we change this you know Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Krishnan. Um, that was a very insightful answer, and I did really appreciate your definition of awakening the community. Um, because I think it's like as you said, very important to include finding solutions. Um, in addition to educating people, so I appreciate how you talked about your experience in creating a movement. Um, now. moving forward uh, some of our council members actually were curious about your journey and your initiatives so we have collected a few questions from them that we would like to ask you um first one is from our member abigna she's asking um while the 2013 bill on rape was monumental um what can we do to bring awareness or to awaken um the community about the rampant rape culture growing in india Oh, uh, rape culture is not unique to India. It's unique globally. So let's be very clear on that. And rape culture, you know, uh, emerges from deep-rooted patriarchal understanding about 
masculinity and and femininity and sexuality and and that's not very unique to india it's very global but india because of its own uh, unique cultural and um, uh, uh, you know uh, diverse um, situation we have our own um, you know complicated uh, la- layers of rape culture uh, and I- i'm saying this because just for you to understand that this exists everywhere in in different formats in india it exists in a one format and the the only way that we can change it you can bring in 100 laws you know um, nothing will nothing will bring a drastic change and then this each one of us do not change the way we bring up our sons and daughters in our own families and so if rape culture has to change uh, you know the, the way the family as an institution is operating across the world has to change the way boys are brought up and the way the girls are brought up everything has to change it's is about uh, you know changing what you try what you endorse in uh, subtly uh, in you know in in small small ways you know it's okay for a boy and it's not okay for a girl so uh, when when you when you very very subtly say that you know a boy can you know have as many flings around and it's okay because it's a boy is a boy you know but when a girl does the same she becomes fast you know she becomes she becomes somebody whose character is questionable uh, you know in some way in multiple ways you are uh, triggering you know a rape culture in your thinking you know and so somebody who doesn't you know uh, kind of conform to that norm that you've created then deserves to be you know violated because she has to be taught a lesson so uh, so it's it's about how we bring our, our sons and daughters how we do our parenting and how do we look at masculinity femininity and sexuality on the whole so uh, i think the the change is starting in the country um you you don't see the uh impact of that change in a big way because all these very regressive um norms globally and in india is very very old it's centuries and centuries old like if you look at for example prostitution you know now prostitution is as old as humanity and uh it is the oldest form of uh, sex slavery it is the oldest form of uh, uh sexual repression where you think that a class of human beings have to be available to uh you know satisfy the libido of the overwhelming libido of men and therefore at one point it was institutionalized as ganika and you know a whole world of systems uh, which even today uh, the, the liberal and the most so called you know ultra feminist will actually support uh, because uh, in the name of now today you will wrap it in another new name called as self determination you know and say okay it's a right of a woman to sell her body and you know things like that so you know we create these very very repressive norms and we commodify a person's body uh, and that commodification is the trigger point for rape culture you know when you start thinking that i own this body and you know i can buy this body i can sell this body and this uh, you know this body is something where i can be trampled upon to either show my ego or my power you know because what is buying and selling it's it's a whole world of power so i think a lot of lot of change has to happen 
within. And I'm just happy to say that the change is beginning, but I think it will take a couple of more centuries for the change to, to you know, sink in and become like a norm. As of now, what we see is only the repressive and the regressive face of it. But I'm very positive it will change. Maybe not in my lifetime, but uh, but in the centuries to come. Right. Um, I'm so glad how you brought up that the rape culture is really a worldwide problem. It's not just specific to India or just specific to certain countries. It's something that all of us see as well. Um, so I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit more about maybe some of the obstacles you faced in legally advocating for laws that do deal with sexual violence. So any um, backlash that you faced while advocating for this change? So, um, you know, more uh, you become successful in terms of uh, the kind of um, uh, practical solutions that you're putting on the ground and more the solutions make sense to uh, a significant part of the world. Uh, at one end, your advocacy efforts become very, very powerful because once your solutions are powerful and your solutions are showing results, automatically your voice and your efforts also become very powerful. Simultaneously, you know, the obstacles to hit you also become very, very powerful because um, more you're able to, you know, kind of... Uh, kind of make that change that you're talking. So if, if the world believes that, you know, prosecution cannot change, and then you've shown that it can change. Um, you know, if the world believes that, you know, rehabilitation of a victim is not possible, and the problem is not possible, community vigilance is not possible, getting survivors to be advocates of the problem is not possible, and then you're making it possible. Then, you know, the world who, who thrives on these power inflation, the world which thrives on this uh, revenue model, the world which thrives on this criminal enterprise looks at you as a huge, huge obstacle in their lives, you know, and they think that wiping you out is, is, a, is going to be a very, very important way to wipe out this voice uh, so that, you know, the solutions, um, uh, really don't work. So how do they wipe you out? So when I started 25, 30 years back, uh, wiping out meant physical assaults, you know, and getting beaten up. But 20 years later, you know, wiping out meant defaming, discrediting, you know, trying to generate, you know, kind of suspicion in the minds of people. Uh, you know, what she is, who she is, or what this organization is, what is this all about? Is this a big hype? And it's a kind of a conspiracy, you know? Uh, I, I would say it's kind of conspiracy. It is a conspiracy because people are paid to do that job. So people are paid to discredit you. People are paid to defame you and, you know, create a counter narrative of what we, what we do. So, um, one of my greatest obstacles in our advocacy work was this huge so-called very intellectual liberal groups opposing everything that we are doing, but not opposing it directly, uh, but opposing it by actually hitting you below the belt. So uh, the way you oppose somebody is to start finding ways and means to discredit the organization, defame the organization, create more and more and more problems for the thing. So for example, our whole entire work for, uh, you know, kind of creating a counter narrative by bringing education as a means to prevent human beings from being inducted into prostitution and looking at say intergenerational prostitution and, um, you know, uh, second generation prostitution, uh, which became so, so powerful uh, that, you know, governments and departments started looking at this model as a, you know, you know, a very, very um, potentially 
uh, very interesting model for them to adapt and replicate. So your advocacy is moving in this way. And then suddenly a whole boom, you know, protest starts saying of a different kind saying that, oh, this woman is detaining a particular community. And, you know, she is, uh, you know, for getting funding or this organization is trying to get funds by defaming a community, you know? And then it's just not about uh, somebody saying this. Your newspaper article starts coming in and, you know, uh, the actual people coming in, standing outside your uh, learning centers, creating one huge amount of drama around your place. And then you, you have a whole world of people, you know, you know, writing all kinds of nonsense on social media and, you know, um, thing. And then, you know, what happens is doubt creeps in, you know, and, uh, you know, even people who believe you start really, you know, I, I, do you think this is happening? Is this, you know, possible? Uh, is that what she's trying to do? Or is this organization that's trying to do? So that becomes one major, major obstacle, you know, and uh, we face that obstacle at every level. You know, we face it for our shelters. We are faced it for our, because you know, as an organization, you know, our model of advocacy is different from another or advocacy organization. Our model of advocacy is that we first demonstrate the solution to you, and then we advocate that solution to the state, to the system, and saying, okay, this is what is working. Now, why don't you try this out? You know. And, uh, and, and therefore, if you bring in a legislative reform, bringing these aspects into it, then maybe things will change. So we're actually showing and demonstrating what is possible. So that demonstration itself, when it is you know, discredited, it becomes very, very difficult. And when it, the obstacle starts also in terms of the attitude of people, these the kind of, uh, you know, so because when we talk about a mindset, we're not talking about some isolated group of people in the society. We're talking about mindsets, which could be a mindset of a bureaucrat, it could be a mindset of a um, policymaker, it could be a mindset of a, uh, of a law enforcer, it could be a mindset of a judge. And so the mindset is something that's seeping through everywhere. So you're fighting, you know, everywhere, like, you know, when we were advocating for the comprehensive legislation to end trafficking. There's this very, very senior politician who gave me a one hour lecture on, you know, you know, I don't know why you people are opposing child marriage. You know, if young boys are married off very early, you know, then their sexual service, you know, uh, you know, libido and their, their sexual gratification will be satisfied early and if they are satisfied early then they will not rape girls they will not buy girls they will not you know become the demand for sex trafficking and and then he kind of concluded you know that since you have got child marriage prohibited that is why you have you know sex trafficking and sex crimes in the country you know because young men are not satisfied sexually and so we are seeking this kind of uh, thing so how do you deal with a, a mindset like that uh, when it is a very, very senior influencer in the society, a senior politician, you know, who, ha who has a huge client, you know, uh, you know, following and things like that. So, uh, so obstacles is about the mindset, obstacles is about the stereotypes, obstacles is also about people who look at you as real threat and will go to any extent. That means paying, you know, even getting uh, really bad articles written in the newspaper, even in international papers done. And so what happens is, uh, you know, you can't ignore these. It's not like, okay, this barking dog, a dog, you know, just ignore it. You keep doing your work. It doesn't work like that because some of these things really start affecting you. Like, for example, when a very, very bad uh, piece was written about us in, in an international paper, it really, really affected us. Funding stopped. You know, a whole world of people wanted instituted inquiry commissions to check on, you know, whether we have, you know, whether all the allegations were true or false. Um, our safeguarding mechanisms were questioned and uh, platforms which was... Uh, 
meant for raising and mobilizing funds were blocked saying that no until all allegations proved okay we will not do it so more than three and a half four months were was wasted for us in answering you know all these inquiry commissions uh, dragging people newspapers to the court or you know giving them legal notices fighting it out you know getting a favorable decision in your in your name and getting compensations for the defamation but end of the day the damage is done how how is anybody going to remember what money xyz newspaper paid you they'll only remember what was spoken about you so a whole world of you know uh, you know a gap comes in what you're trying to do because they derail you from that track you know? and therefore the challenge is how do we keep you know reaffirming reiterating and you know um, ensuring that your own uh, you know faith in what you're doing and what the the the, the goal and the destination that you're going you don't get track you know distracted from that so it's a constant battle and it's a constant battle to keep yourself because you know these are processes that can become very very uh, depleting you get burnt out you are stressed uh, you don't like to be constantly some, if, if somebody is calling you you know once there's also this period or rather there is a period even now that is happening where people actually called me rafa keeper said that you know what is she she doesn't have any shelter she actually sends girls to prostitution and this is not said something like lower it's like very high high and then there's a, when you do it at that high level then there's somebody else oh my god so and so is saying she's such an important person or he's such an important person maybe a point one of that might be the truth so you're looking everybody is looking at you with the lens of suspicion and when that lens of suspicion is completely on you again and again uh, you, you it's not very it's not very comfortable times you know so you you are emotionally spiritually and morally depleted and therefore this little gap comes in your work in terms of you know there are moments where you feel you know should i just stop for a little while and then you know you can't stop and you continue and the more that more you continue the obstacles only increase because this person is thinking oh my god we did so much to her and she still she isn't left she's still there you know so she left increase the level of you know it's like a huge obstacle race you know where progressively as you move forward towards your destination closer and closer the obstructions obstacles become bigger and bigger and you like you're given bigger challenges so it's like that okay like this oh my god she's not fallen flat now or this organization is still there and she's still giving speeches here and there and she's still you know uh, being recognized and she her work is still happening so then we need to increase the obstacles for her so if today it was about me then tomorrow it will become about my family and my husband is dragged into the situation or somebody else so Like, you know everything and everything is tried out as an obstacle the point here is how do you deal with it and what the, what are the choices you make in uh, looking at it so for me i've been very lucky uh, from from the word go from my from the initial years of my life till date i have looked at always an obstacle as an as an opportunity as 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 an extraordinary opportunity for me to experiment on something new so every time they have created those obstacles and if they're listening to this program right now sitting wherever they are and i'm sure they will they will get a copy of this this uh, particular session that we are doing right now um i i just want to thank each of those obstacle creators for me thing because every time you you create an obstacle for me i i i get a new idea to safeguard to better my programs to uh, strengthen my um the uh, my mission to strengthen the strategy that we are uh, you know recommending because you give us better ideas so 
I think my my adversaries and my obstacle creators are my best friends. If not for them, I wouldn't have traveled so far. Yeah, thank you so much for your insight. Um, this has been a very informative conversation and we're so grateful for um, your work and your the organization and all the work that your organization does. Um, and it would be our pleasure to be able to support your mission. So um, we'll be reaching out to you to receive any information about Prajwala um, that you would wish to share with us that maybe we can also spread um, on our and share on our social media and newsletters. Um, so thank you again for joining so much and um, answering all I of think our- the important thing is to continue the change of awakening. If 18 of you all are awakened today, it's very important that each of you take responsibility and immediately, not after 100 years, you know. And today the world is, 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 is such that each one of us can take immediate responses. Responses. There is no need for a more than like, you know, once upon a time, your families, your fam parents would be saying that, you know, once we are financially, you know, well settled, then we will do some charity. You don't need to wait for that. You can do it right now. Uh, you have your Twitter, you have your Facebook, you have your Instagram. Whatever the session has happened, if it has touched you, it has given you certain reflections, if it has transformed you in a even in a little way, write about it, talk about it, you know, continue the change, a chain of awakening, you know, uh, and uh, that is possible, uh, you know, uh, right now. And, and that is what each one of us have to think because uh, uh, one, one human being, uh, sexually violated, one person sexually trafficked is one too many. And therefore the urgency is now. And I hope each one of you will find ways to start responding right away and not wait for you to become professionals and then okay, uh, maybe then we will start uh, giving up things. Um, I keep telling all the students, you know, what stops you from dedicating one of your birthdays to end, you know, to, to, to not just raise awareness and awakening, but also to uh, request people to donate whatever gifts that they want to give you as a donation to a charity that you like who's fighting for a cause that you believe in. So start doing things, make that as your life norm, you know, make it as the way you live. Believe me, uh, you can be the change. You can be the change uh, if you decide to be the change every day in your own lives. But thank you so much for inviting me and I hope this session has been useful to each one of you all. Yes, thank you, Dr. Christian. That was such a powerful and strong message and I'm sure all of us will take it to heart this evening. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us on an early morning to talk about your life experiences and your mission and all of your work. Uh, I will now pass it on to Anisha, um, our vice president to wrap up tonight's conversation. Yeah, so thank you, Dr. Krishnan for talking with us today. We really appreciated your insights and learned a lot from you today. And also a huge thank you to the entire ISA council for making this event possible. And also Kavya and Darpa for moderating. And last but not least, thank you to the audience members who were able to join us this evening. If you're interested in this event, please make sure to check us out on social media to stay updated and informed about future virtual events. And if you know any of your friends and family that missed this event live, no worries, because this event is recorded and will be uploaded onto our YouTube page with our other past speaker event. So please check both out. Um, thank you again for your time. This concludes our event and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye.